Good morning. Um, this is a, a, an extreme honor to be receiving the Libor Award. I'm really grateful to the selection committee for selecting me this year and to BBRF for continuous support for many years since I started as a young fellow at Yale when I received my very first grant ever, which was a NARSAD award at that time. Um, so what, I, uh, what I'm gonna do today is tell you a little bit about the work I've done over the last 30 years uh, and pretty much 15 minutes. That leaves me with about uh, half a minute per year. So, um, so I'll just focus on the big picture um, so is this? Okay. Uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, so I'm gonna tell you about the work we've done using imaging to study dopamine transmission and schizophrenia. I'm gonna tell you why, how we do it, the findings we've had, and what we've learned from work in mice by our collaborators about the impact of abnormal dopamine on the brain and give you some of our future directions. So if you think about the symptoms in schizophrenia, what's really noticeable is that almost every functional domain is affected. You will see problems in perception, uh, that lead to hallucinations, uh, paranoia, delusions, thought disturbances. Uh, there are deficits in reward processing with lack of motivation, lack of drive, um, lack of uh, feeling pleasure. Mood disturbances, patients may experience depression or excitement that are out of the range of ordinary. Cognitive deficits in almost every single cognitive domain social cognition, being able to read emotions and respond uh, adequately. Um, the other types of cognitive deficits like working memory, executive function, uh, processing what's happening and adjusting behavior accordingly. Movement abnormalities. So really every functional domain in the brain is affected. So that led me to think that schizophrenia is a global brain disease. So how does dopamine fit into this? Well, dopamine is involved really in every aspect of those uh, functional domains, and that's what I will uh, tell you about, and then tell you how abnormalities in dopamine may uh, interact with these brain functions to lead to the symptoms we see. So where is dopamine in the brain, and, and what does it do? Uh, I just have to take you through some of the anatomy. Uh, so I'm representing here some of the cortical regions, and they're color-coded for what they do. Uh, there are regions that process emotions. Uh, we call these limbic regions. So that's, for example, this uh, orange, co orange color for the orbitofrontal cortex. Uh, some regions process cognitive information. They're represented in yellow, uh, such as the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and others process sensory motor information. These project to the striatum, which is also divided across these functional domains. And from the striatum, there are projections into the pallidum and the thalamus, and then the thalamus projects back to the cortex. These are the cortical, striato, pallido, thalamo, cortical loops, or cortico basal ganglia loops. And they're very important because they pretty much organize our behavior across all these functional domains of processing emotions, uh, processing thinking and, and, and uh, cognition, and processing movements and sensation. Now dopamine is uh, really projecting to all these key regions and that uh, circuit in the brain and modulating the activity in all of these regions. So um, what, to tell you a little bit more about that, there are the mesocortical pathway projecting to the cortex, the mesolimbic pathway and the nigrostriatal pathways to the midsection, associative, and to the sensory motor part. So dopamine, uh, br uh, dopamine cells in the midbrain signal unexpected reward. So if you have an experience that's better than the expectation, you'll have firing of those dopamine cells. If the experience is worse, you have silencing of these dopamine cells. So it's really kind of tracking the mismatch between 
the uh, expectation and experience, which is a key function. It's a teaching signal. It basically, if you extrapolate from these type of studies and rodents to humans, dopamine is really telling us something is good, go back, do this more, or something is bad, stay away, avoid it. In the cortex, dopamine is fine-tuning the circuitry. It's modulating both the GABAergic inhibitory interneurons and the pyramidal glutamatergic cells in a way that makes the cortex more efficient to be able to do the functions that the cortex has to do, which is subsurf cognition. And then finally, within the basal ganglia subnuclei, the outflow within these nuclei is modulated by the D1 and the D2 receptors, which, which are dopaminergic receptors. And it's done in such a way that the D1 is the go pathway and the D2 is a no-go pathway. They have opposing effects on the thalamus so that the communication from the thalamus back to the cortex is really controlled by the balance between the go and the no-go. So dopamine and dopaminergic receptors are really key to, in terms of the function of the circuitry that is essential for our behavior. We also know that all drugs we have in schizophrenia are D2 drugs, blockers or, or functional antagonists. And that dopamine, if, if patients take dopamine agonists, that their, their psychosis gets worse. So when I started my career, this was the, the point of view of the field, is that the mesocortical pathway must be deficient, and that's why patients with schizophrenia have cognitive abnormalities or negative symptoms, and the mesolimbic pathway is overactive, and that explains the psychosis. So what we've done is use imaging to look at this um, uh, in, in vivo and in, in patients, compare those to controls. Uh, this is the synaptic machinery, and there are multiple probes one can use to look at dopamine in the brain. But the one that I've used is the following. We, uh, set, we, we inject targets for the D2 receptors, radio tracers, the radioactive uh, specific drugs for the D2 receptor. And we do a scan with the PET scanner before and after we kind of manipulate the system to change dopamine levels. So by doing a scan before and then after this dopaminergic manipulation, we can see the change in the D2 radio tracer binding. And that change is correlated to how much dopamine was in that presynaptic nerve terminal. We also can get how much dopamine was in the synapse at baseline by doing an opposite uh, manipulation. So basically, by combining the D2 radio tracer and pharmacological challenges, we can get at how much dopamine is in a brain region. What we have found, and other people have replicated our work, with e even using other type of methodology, is that there is indeed excess dopamine release in the striatum in schizophrenia. But what was interesting is that this excess was not just in the mesolimbic system. It was actually more noticeable in the midsection of the striatum and the nigrostriatal associative pathway. So that is the region that's involved in processing cognition. And uh, we went on to, to, to try to understand what does this uh, excess mean. So uh, we know that it's related to um, psychosis, very specifically, and it predicts how well patients will respond to antipsychotics. We also found that this region where you have the most dopamine is the one across the striatum that has the weakest connectivity to the rest of the brain, so really the excess dopamine is affecting the function of that brain region and how it processes information. Uh, and you'll hear also from Guillermo Horga later, this excess dopamine is doing something to sensory processing that is relating to hallucinations. So we're really kind of trying to understand how you go from excess dopamine to the symptoms that are related to it. Uh, moving on to the cortex, we found that in the cortex, in the DLPFC, actually there is a deficit in dopamine. This is what, uh, the, the, what had been predicted. Patients with schizophrenia don't 
displace that radio tracer much in the cortex. And the ability to release dopamine is related to the ability to activate during a working memory, perform a working memory task of the prefrontal cortex. So it really may have an impact on the function of the prefrontal cortex. What was really uh, interesting about this um, the study is that we were also able to get uh, dopamine outside, uh, even outside of the cortex and other brain regions. And what we found is that all other brain regions outside of the striatum show the same deficit in dopamine. So you really, in schizophrenia, have a hypodopaminergic brain with just one exception, which is the striatum. And within the striatum, mostly the associative striatum is overactive. And that is really kind of uh, puzzling, because how could that happen? How could it be that in the midbrain, for example, we don't detect an increase? Where is the increase in the striatum coming from? So at this point, we're considering the possibility that it's not really coming from overactivity of the pathway, but it could be from local regulation of dopamine in the striatum by other systems. And one of those suspects is the cholinergic system. So we're moving on to look at acetylcholine uh, uh, integrity within the brain and patients with schizophrenia to try to see if it links and if it explains the dopaminergic dysregulation that we see. We gained a lot of insights from work by co our collaborators, Eric Kendall and his lab. Eleanor Simpson and Christoph Kellendonk, who got interested in the finding of excess D2 stimulation in the striatum uh, in schizophrenia that we have found. And they engineered a transgenic mouse that has excess D2 signaling in the dorsal striatum during development uh, for a transient period for like two weeks, and then they turned the gene off. So this is a model where a mouse, when it's young, as, as it's, the brain is developing, has excess D2 signaling in the striatum. That's all they did. And what was really profound about this, this mouse is that they've uncovered all kinds of off-target, around the whole circuitry, abnormalities that are a result of that very local abnormality in the striatum. So in the cortex, they see uh, abnormal dopamine and GABA, they see abnormal uh, firing of uh, the, the midbrain dopamine cells, and they see a rewiring uh, between the go and the no-go pathway uh, in the basal ganglia. So, abnormal dopamine signaling during development in the striatum is enough to cause all kinds of problems with the development of the circuitry. And that is very important because that takes me to like the building the model that we're thinking about right now, which is we know that a lot of the genes that confer risk for schizophrenia are dopamine-related genes. So they may confer, confer abnormal activity of D2 and dopaminergic system. If this is combined with environmental insults, such as inflammation, drugs, urbanicity, diet, that all can contribute to excess dopamine in the brain, then you have a situation during development with excessive dopamine uh, signaling within, within uh, certain brain regions that can produce an abnormal development of cells and circuits so that biasing the brain in a way that is suboptimal. And then at one point, there's the added uh, possibility of stress or a factor during development that comes on board and dysregulates presynaptic dopamine to an even uh, bigger extent, and that uh, leads to the clinical syndrome that we see. So in some patients, it may be that dopamine is not just the end result, but it's something that's already brewing in the brain that's contributing to all the other problems that we see uh, in schizophrenia that makes it such a global disease, as, as I said earlier. I want to leave you with a few thoughts. Uh, dopamine is linked to psychosis and its response to D2 drugs. We've shown this in vivo. Uh, this interaction is specific to the striatum. This excess dopamine is only in the striatum, and especially the associative striatum. 
but it's also involved in the developmental trajectory of the brain that makes it vulnerable to general global pathology. It can contribute to aberrant wiring, aberrant learning, because it's a learning signal, aberrant development that precedes onset, and these are all much more difficult to study, these kind of diffuse effects on the circuitry during development of abnormal dopamine. We need methods to track dopamine over time before onset in vulnerable populations to be able to intervene before onset. Uh, neuromelanin MR imaging is one example of those methodologies that we're hoping to develop and uh, Guillermo has uh, kind of led this effort and I'll talk to you about it a little, in a little while. Um, so, um, am I on time? Okay, good. So I wanna just, this is, this is really the work of a team a team that has evolved over many years with some very important players, Mark Leruel in the beginning of the work, Mark Slifstein, Roberto Gill, Larry Kegelis, or senior members of my team, and some younger people like Guillermo Horga and Jared Van Snellenberg who've really brought in all the fMRI sophistication to be able to do multimodal imaging to put together the MR and the PET to be able to make sense out of the findings. Uh, I've benefited from work with collaborators at Columbia who've been really in, uh, crucial in shaping our thinking about what we're observing with imaging. And I've benefited from the input of amazing mentors. Started my work with Daniel Weinberger and Joel Kleinman at NIMH. I learned the, the PET methodology from Bob Innes. And I've had really this uh, kind of mentor at large with John Crystal who's had a beneficial influence on my career for many, many years. Uh, I want to thank NIMH, NIDA, and BBRF for their support. I've been very fortunate to get actually four grants, all the grants possible from BBRF. Uh, and it has really been helpful at key points of all this research. When, when one project is way too novel for NIMH reviewers who in their ultimate wisdom decide, wait, this is too premature, well, BBRF reviewers know better, and uh, we've been able to move along uh, the way with their help. I want to thank patients and their family for their trust in uh, coming to our lab and doing these studies that are, you know, uh, quite burdensome sometimes. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>